Today I'm going to talk about usual interstitial pneumonia, and the reason is that you, if you ever get a biopsy for interstitial lung disease, this is really the elephant in the room. This is the one diagnosis that you absolutely must know about, and everything else becomes not UIP. So is it UIP or is it not UIP really is usually the central question in these cases. I have no relevant disclosures. Here is basically the bottom line of this talk. So I'll, I'll give you the bottom line up front, then we'll go through the talk and I'll repeat the bottom line at the end. First of all, UIP is a pathologic diagnosis. This is something that does not require clinical correlation. This is a diagnosis that can be made on a biopsy specimen based purely on pathologic features. However, IPF is a clinical diagnosis. This is a diagnosis that clinicians make, not pathologists. So if you ever hear a biopsy diagnosis of IPF, that's absolutely incorrect. That just cannot be done. IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a diagnosis that clinicians make after taking into account the biopsy findings, the radiologic findings, whatever else they know in the clinical history, and they put it together to make that final conclusion that the disease is idiopathic. Now, whether they're accurate or not is a completely different question, but the diagnosis is based on, on a clinical summation of everything together. The second point I want to make here, and this is different than how UIP and IPF is usually taught. Usually you're taught that for, for interstitial lung diseases, radiologic correlation is very important. So if you get a biopsy, look at the CT scan. If you're ever sending it out for consult, send the CD of the radiologic findings with it. And that's been traditional teaching. And to some extent, that's true. You do want to know the radiologic context. For example, you don't want to have a pneumothorax specimen and make a diagnosis of UIP on that. In most cases, that will, will, it will just look stupid. So you do want to have some, some context. On the other hand, you can be very much misled by the radiologic context. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on today, on showing how the radiology can actually mislead you and how this little balance between radiology and, and pathology happens. So the greatest value of pathology today in the current age in the diagnosis of IPF is to identify cases of UIP precisely in those cases where radiology cannot make the diagnosis. So if you circle around and look at radiology in those cases, you are not going to be helped. You are going to be misled. So we are looking at cases more and more where there's no honeycombing on chest CT, and they're asking us, is this UIP or not? So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Let's start with some basics. Let's just start with basic terms in lung pathology. Most of us don't look at lung pathology on, on a daily basis. So let's just start with absolute basics. Airways and air spaces are two different things. So airways are bronchi and bronchioles. So you see at the bottom here, this airway lacks cartilage, so it's a bronchiole. The air spaces are the spaces that are within the alveoli. So that's a useful distinction to make. So these are the air spaces, and the one at bottom left is an airway. We're going to present a few fantastic cases of interstitial lung disease that it's likely you guys are going to run into one of these over the next year. I don't get much follow back on that statement, you know? When no. I say that each, and they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I bet you did. I bet you ran into some stuff. And maybe this, these uh, little pearls have helped the day. Actually, these pearls are really, when I did my top 10 pearls, these seven are part of the top 10. So these are like the most essential pearls of ILD. And like Kevin says, these are their common cases. These are the acute lung injury cases, the granuloma cases, the fibrosis cases. And so hopefully these pearls, you'll be able to take them and put them in your back pocket and change your, change your approach. Yeah, we could almost call these bread and butter, non-neoplastic lung disease. Non-neoplastic pearls. So we'll start with topic six, the first pearl. These are as mentioned, key pearls, interstitial lung disease and their mimics that should change your approach. Pearl one, history, 51-year-old woman, cough, sore throat, blood-tinged sputum in the past few weeks. So her tempo is subacute, a few weeks, not one, not one day, not one week, not three months. She has this chest x-ray. She's got bilateral increased attenuation, ground glass appearance, 
Some areas, the ground glass is becoming sufficiently dense, you lose structure behind it. So when the smoke is deep and strong, that's consolidation. I get a sense for some of this being a little nodular, nodules within nodules. Almost a little bit of a butterfly distribution yeah. to that infiltrate. Yeah, kind of right? sparing. If you draw a line around the infiltrates, it looks like butterfly wings on either side of the mediastinum. Kind of like pulmonary edema. Yes. So it was decided that the patient needed a surgical lung biopsy to puzzle this out. Hemorrhage is always something, you know, it's subtle. The history of it, the patient coughs up, coughs up, getting blood three or four times a day over a couple of weeks. It's kind of frightening for patients. And it, it raises some, some serious concerns. So this is why the clinicians often will move aggressively towards getting a diagnosis. These, so The yeah. dots on this slide were from the submitting pathologist in this case. Yeah, I put them there so you know where to look. Yeah, your hypotheticals self. My hypothetical self did that. So I'm looking at these surgical biopsies, and I'm seeing a lot of blood. And I remember that, you know, blood can happen in the lung. I see it all the time in biopsies. And when it's red blood like this, fresh, you know, I usually ignore it because I think it's probably the, something about the surgical technique. But we get up closer on this biopsy, and there's arteries that look a little funny, a little too thick. Sometimes they have something in their lumen that isn't just red cells, maybe some maybe little coagulum in there. Too many fish swimming in a bowl that increase nuclei in that muscle. Over here, another irregular pulmonary artery. Looks like it's got a little thromboembolus maybe in the center. The adventitia looks to be a little thickened. And blood all around in the parenchyma. So I'm scanning the blood, looking for stuff, and lo and behold, I find this, which is a polyp of organizing pneumonia within a segment of lung, pulmonary artery out here on the side. I am going to uh, go through this quickly so that I'm not a, the person who's standing between you and lunch. No disclosures. Goal, to present both sides of the argument and tell you which side I come on, on some selected issues. First controversy, DIP, or desquamative interstitial pneumonia. This has been with us since Lebo's original description. People generally know that it means lots of macrophages within the alveoli. How many? Nobody knows. It's the pro side, the, the side that likes the term DIP says, DIP is an idiopathic interstitial pneumonia mostly caused by cigarette smoking. Does that make any sense? It's idiopathic, <laughs> mostly caused by cigarette smoking. <laughs> All right. In fact, it is classified under the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias in the ATS ERS. Here it is. Even they knew that they were saying something that didn't make sense. Because back in 2002, they said, the term DIP is retained in this document, but it presents several problems. And they went and listed all those problems and then kept the term. Here are all these features of uh, desquamative interstitial pneumonia. If you look from one paper to another to another, there's absolutely nothing consistent between the various definitions. In fact, there's a paper that came out a couple of years ago, it said, in, in the European Respiratory Journal, smoking-related idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. I feel like Steve Harvey, you know, when somebody gives a silly answer and he just stares at them. Just imagine the, the conversation between the patient and their doctor. The doctor says, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith, you have DIP. He goes, what is DIP, doc? A smoking-related idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. What's the cause of it? Smoking. What does idiopathic mean? <laughs> it means we don't know what the cause is. <laughs> what do we say? This is lung terminology. So my take is that DIP is a misnomer, and there is absolute agreement among everybody that DIP is a misnomer, nothing is desquamated in it, and I feel that it's also an obsolete entity. And this is supported by um, Dr. Kadzenstein's paper in Journal of Clinical Pathology. This is almost six years ago now. 
The problems with DIP are many. It's a misnomer, no question about it. It lumps together clearly smoking-related entities with other entities that are not smoking-related. It causes the false impression that it's steroid-responsive. It has never been shown, ever, that a steroid-responsive, uh, smoking-related anything is responsive to steroids. The histologic criteria are poorly defined, and it's applied indiscriminately. You just need to see a couple of macrophages, and you can call something DIP. And it's based on a very common nonspecific finding. Macrophages seem to be the cell of the day today.